Uh, welcome to uh, Route TV. Here we have uh, some non-Swedish, non-Finnish uh, interview person uh, about uh, extreme metal called primordial or pri primordial like we say in Finland. Uh, welcome, Alan. How are things going with you? Awesome. That is so great. I mean, here in Sweden, we just love this kind of personalities. Uh, you're playing tonight at uh, Steel Chaos. How does that work for you? I have the wrong mustache for this festival. Do you think we need to take a little bit of sip of beer? It would be most excellent to do this. Let's have a beer. Cheers. Awesome. Or like we say in Finland, <laughs> kippis or... Skål, like they say in Sweden. In Ireland it's slancher. Slancher. I think in Scotland it was a slancher. Yeah. Slancher, yeah, in Irish it's like cheers or whatever, yeah. So you can have that. Sweden, you need to have war, sort you out. That would be brutal. <laughs> so, uh, prime... It's coming anyway, so you might as well. I think, it's, I think it's already coming because all of the, you know, shh stuff. We don't want to talk a little too much about politics. So, let's talk. Primordial, you've been here for more than 20 years. You're a long timers. You have been doing a huge amount of albums. You have a quite new album out and all that stuff. So what are the fresh news we need to hear from you? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, it's 27 years. 27? I, I know, it's ridiculous. Um, I joined the band, I think, a week after my 16th birthday. Um, so you still you look like 16. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, uh, thank you, it's my Botox mainly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, uh, we, I, listen, I answered an ad around that time and um, we didn't start the band as friends. We became friends, we didn't start the band as friends, so it's kind of a strange way that the band began in that we didn't start um, as friends to fall out. We didn't really socialize together. Um, we kind of started off quite serious for a bunch of teenagers and it just so happens that it, it, whatever route we've navigated through all the seas, which usually will shipwreck most bands, we've, I don't know, navigated, what's nautical references? Um, must be the sea. Yeah, it must be, that's what it is, yeah. Uh, no, it's, um, it's odd, it's like um, something, nothing will happen for three or four months where we wouldn't see each other and we'd still, you know, talk vaguely on email or whatever and then when we have something to do, we have something to do. But it's um, it's not the people just get on with their lives in the meantime. But yeah, somehow it rolled around that we have nine albums. I don't know how that happened. <laughs> I definitely didn't plan it when I was 16. But here we are. So, and the thankful, the thing I think which is the most important thing is that um, no, we're not like a sort of nostalgia act to our teenage selves, and that nobody comes tonight wanting to hear just play the debut play the first album uh it doesn't we've managed to avoid that which is you know thankful that people want to hear new songs and new stuff you know we, you know what i mean when you go and see a band of middle-aged men and everybody goes oh play the album you made when you're 20 or whatever you know so i don't know rambling <laughs> nonsense i don't i don't know what the news is it's uh, it's but it's okay you know it's so basically he's saying they don't have any news so about these ramblings which is always the thing we hear do um you you are one of those bands with really epic stuff when it comes to music you're kind of a unique snowflake is it a thing of a treasure or a kind of a burden no, it's, um, <clears throat> it, was it was never planned. I mean, the thing about Primordial is that there was no grand plan. We didn't sit down and say, okay, the second album is going to be black metal, then we're going to make a folk metal record, then we're going to do this, then we're going to do that. It, it's all a bit haphazard. It's a bit chaotic. It's, a bit, it's quite Irish, if you know Irish people. It's quite off the cuff, spontaneous, ill-rehearsed, ill-thought out, but somehow we scrape through by the seat of our pants most of the time. And this, whatever we meant, like if you look at, we released a seven inch in the box, wooden box set of the last album, Where Greater Men Have Fallen, which is our first two songs we wrote in rehearsal in summer of 91. And you know, it's sounding a bit like sort of schizophrenia, sepultura meets simplistic kind of some ale, autopsy, slow riffing. And somewhere between that and the next six months, we, we sort of hit on a, an idea, a style, or a, as much as we could, which was that 
we took sort of the chord and structure sometimes of Irish traditional music, not the d lie bit, but if you listen to the acoustic guitar in the background, you hear these full chords, and we mixed that with the sort of Hammer Heart, Twilight of the Gods, Bathory, and what was happening around us at the time, which was influences of the second wave of black metal, you know, Varathron, Enslaved, um, Necromantia, Rotting Christ, whatever was going on, Master's Hammer. Not that the sound influenced, but this, the scene and sort of belonging to that. Kind of ideas. Yeah, just belonging to this tape trading zine world and just wanting to do something a bit darker, a bit more epic, a bit grandiose. And then, you know, things like Hammerheart and Twilight of the Gods showed us that you could have an eight minute long song with no solo and no chorus. And these sort of tectonic shape shifting soundtrack esque songs. And that's what kind of where we fell into our niche, but it wasn't planned. I think we were just, and also, probably you have something similar in Finland, but in Ireland you're geographically isolated. So you kind of grow up mutating and twisted in your own scene. And you can't, it's not like you can get in a car and drive across uh, and put trade gigs with some other band for the weekend. And like if you're German, go and play in Holland or in Austria. So we're sort of a bit isolated and we, this sort of helps us in a way achieve something oddly original. But that was never our plan. Better than multi drinks. <laughs> I mean, you, you, when you were saying that or asking, like, if I know anything about Irish culture, yeah, I've been like a week in Dublin, so I, I know everything about it. I just got drunk. <laughs> But to be a um, more less humorous side, what is the Irish metal scene like in general? Has it changed or are you the only ones, you know, keeping up the true flame of the true extreme metal? No, no, it's um, <clears throat> it's like any... it's it's. I, I'll, Like any scene, I'll put it to you this way. It was probably more a more interesting con concept than just saying, oh, there's this band that, you know, there's Money Beloved and Krokan and Abad Incarnate and all these old bands who are our vintage. But one of the things that's more, probably, perhaps quite interesting about Ireland is that it, I used to go to this metal w uh, website called The Boneyard, which was just full of down, um, it got taken down, but it was full of obscure 80s heavy metal records from Venezuela to Peru to Mexico to Bulgaria to Hungary to all these places <clears throat> and it, you could go by country Ireland had literally nothing two three records there's no Irish Tormentor or Mephisto or um, you know there's no Irish like classic post-punk punk from 81 that you've missed that's there's no Irish black flag there's no Irish discharge yeah. It's really, really strange, but in the 80s, when we were teenagers in Ireland, all of this stuff is missing. There's, a, I mean, there are people who are trying to do something, but there's no, I couldn't tell you like, oh man, there's this classic band that's like the Irish Masters Hammer from 89, you, you've never heard it. It doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. So this strange lack of ambition and lack of uh, underground sort of um, adventure of Ireland in the 80s, was kind of stifling, you know, to be around this really strange lack of musical um, invention. And then literally the second wave of black death metal happened, a whole bunch of confused teenagers like we were came up and we wanted to change this and do something different. We started to do fanzines, churn out, you know, newsletters, make our little scene. <clears throat> uh, and we came from that kind of 88, 89 to 92 sort of period where we sort of decided, okay, we're, it wasn't conscious, but we were decided that we're going to do something with this scene. And so you have Primordial, Morning Beloved, Kurokon, and a bunch of other bands who are still going, who are all from that period. And we were like the first bands who really did anything to put the country on the map. I mean, if you look and search around on YouTube, you can find Albanian heavy metal from the 80s. Doesn't, it's not. Why, and, and so this, what's more interesting to me is why all that stuff is missing from Ireland from the 80s. Because if you think about it, we have everything in place, culturally, historically, and socially, to create angry, aggressive, against everything music. You know, we have a society that's rife with religious oppression, being pulled apart by um, the proximity of terrorism. 
you have um, uh, people, young people are angry, having to <laughs> having to <laughs> having to migrate for a future. Uh, there's oppression by the church, oppression by the empire next to us. All of the stuff. There should be an Irish discharge, right? Yes, indeed. There isn't. That's, that's, so, that's so weird because, I mean, like... Sorry, that was a really long answer, but I think it's more interesting than me just listing off the bands that yeah, were... Yeah, yeah, nobody, nobody cares about that. No, no one cares. I mean, like, like, it's weird because, like, for example, England, your so uh, beloved like, neighbor, like, has a lot of bands, but... Oh, well, let me just say, I mean, I knew of... Tur what is this band from Finland? Turvit Cadet, Turvat Cadet? Yeah, I knew I knew of about that and a bunch of other Finnish punk bands mm -hmm. of course in the late say early would it be early 90s or something like this and we knew that there's what Black Death and uh, not Black Death that's a, think about it now No, I just not the moment to think of control through seven inches in my head yeah. I'll think about it in a minute because yeah. it's on my iPod um, and but we knew I knew of Finnish bands from the 80s mm -hmm. you know um, we don't have that. It's very sorry. Go on with your point. I just interrupted you totally to go. Hey, let me just remember something on the camera. <laughs> let me troll through my memory for. No, go on. Yeah. Well, yeah. It comes back. If it comes back, it comes back. That's no problem. Yeah, yeah. Um, but how things have changed. I mean, both lyrically and you know, just you know, creating riffs and all that stuff during the 27 years. How has the uh, the aging process changed you? Um, not much, to be honest. I mean, I admire orthodoxy. I admire stubbornness. I admire a closed mind, almost when it comes to certain things, such as black metal. I don't believe in, um, in you know, in introducing prog influences just because you can play or being open-minded about this, that, or the other, for the sake of it. So when Primordial can go into the studio and create a riff, and Kieran will go, "Oh, it sounds like fucking Beherit," we'll all go. Yeah, cool, fine. It, it, we don't need to progress more than we did in '92, but we often can. But there's no commitment to being, to sounding, you know, old and that we can play now. I don't. We don't really have any. Um, doesn't really mean much to me. The, the same things I believed in. A lot of the same things I believed in '92 about music still stand fast. Um, I don't mind if a song has two riffs, and the drumming sounds like, the drum sound sounds like Winter Skuga or whatever. To me, that's way better than whatever modern stuff. And we don't, you know, we play live in the studio. We don't use click track. We don't cut and paste. We try and do everything to the point analog um, until tape. The real, you know, it's too, a bit too expensive now. But we don't really have a... Um, I could list off things that have changed, but sometimes... It's exactly the same. What about lyrics? Uh, well, I'm older, you know, and obviously I'm not going to write about the same thing I did when I was 17 or 18, but I, I still will sing a song. Like, say, we, the last time we played in Russia, um, we met these dudes in the... It was very strange. We went out the night before, and the promoter met, uh, put out something on social media and said, oh, the band are in this bar. And all the, these people just started to arrive, and they were like, oh, you, can you play a song from the demo? And um, So we hadn't played that in like <clears throat> 20 years so we thought okay yeah well let's try this and I have no problem standing up on the stage singing the lyrics I wrote when I was 16 17 they're not that bad oddly enough I think it's maybe because we didn't proselytize that much when we were teenagers I wasn't full of oddly enough fiery blatant nonsense rhetoric when I was 17 18 as I should have been maybe for whatever reason um I sing some of the things that I wrote back then, and they don't seem... I can still stand behind them. Not quite sure exactly what I meant, but, you know. <laughs> I think I know. Now you didn't need to take a sip of the beer. Um, <laughs> we have actually beer pauses. Well, but the thing about it is, though, I was... a lot of Some of the themes that I was, you know, banging on about 20 years ago, I'm still talking about them. It's just the, 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 the enemies are different. The faces on the bodies are, the, are different. The... I'm more traveled, um, I'm more conscious of the structures that are, exist in the world, and it's, but it's still defined by this angry sentiment, you know, which hasn't entirely changed. Here's a man in a Venom shirt. <laughs> <laughs> and now we, oh, oh well, now we got this really special guest. Uh, oh, 
Oh, uh, that's Laura from Satanic War Master. You still might remember that wonderful uh, interview we did, not to, you know, but, but anyway, uh, back, to, back to the very topics. Very sweet venom shirt. No, go away, uh, or you can just sit there. Um, okay, but you mentioned enemies. Now you get me really, really, really curious. Enemies, name them. Name the enemies. Um, Abstract or otherwise, I don't mind. Well, you know, she's, she's standing down from the German parliament in three years, what is it? So, you know, she wasn't around 25 years ago. Uh, no, it's, um, I've become more, I was always into politics years ago. Um, but, you know, obviously when you're 20, 21, 22, you know less about the world and you've traveled less and stuff. And um, that bridge into middle age is rather important for settling your, um, the nature of some of the ways you look at society and culture and history and stuff like that. But Primordial was historical or cultural in its intent 20, 25 years ago, you know? So th it's like a variation on a theme, but it's not like I lost any of the sort of... Fire? No, no, I, you know, there's so much stuff to be angry about in this world. Um, you just have to be more focused with your, the sight of your target, I guess, you know? You're sort of a multi-talent in the terms of, you know, being in the music industry, you do all kinds of crazy stuff. I'm not going to list it there, but you know, you know yourself what, what I mean. Uh, do you still have the luxury of being angry? The luxury of being angry, what a strange sentence. Uh, and my, 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 I mean, like, I have tons of lists to do myself, you know, family, bands, you know, doing media stuff and all, all the stuff. Then you have your day job and all the stuff. I don't have the luxury to be angry. I just have to be cynical, uh, you know. But uh, yeah. you ha do you have it? Well, it's it's it is it's easy to be cynical, and it's easy goody. It's it's quite easy to just set yourself up in opposition without any answers and just want to destroy everything. Um, I don't want to destroy things. I'm just curious. <laughs> I understand. I understand this this instinct, but um, I think um, maybe I was sort of quite. Maybe I was a bit born old, you know, and a lot of my attitudes um, for when I was quite young were inherited from my grandparents, you know, who fought in the Second World War or something like this. And they sort of, um, a nature of some sort of conservatism or something like this, or stoicism, or I suppose this sort of stiff upper lip attitude to certain things, which was at odds to the Irish character um, when I was growing up was quite prevalent. I was quite a sort of bookish, nerdish teenager who was always interested in history and, you know, um, writing and language. And <clears throat> the band was an opportunity to open a channel to be able to travel to some of the countries that I'd previously only read about. And then to be able to try and see history as a, history and culture as a, to place it on a, a sort of, on a timeline. And true enough, the things that made me angry 20, 25 years ago uh, are, I think we have to be careful to not get caught up in false narratives. And we have to realize that a lot of the way the media is organized now is designed to profit from our outrage, you know? Exactly. so. When somebody sends me a link to something and I have to go, why have you sent me this? Do I really need to read it? And really how, you know, how great is the volume that surrounds this topic? Um, but, it's for, but for sure there is, without a doubt, enough to still get inspiration from and to be angry about or well, let's call it rage rather than <laughs> anger. Focused rage. Um, yeah, because, you know, there's... A lot of very serious things happen in the world, and I'm I'm quite glad that I never set out my stall 25 years ago to sing about goblins and ghouls and nonsense. In that, I always sang about this. Only I've grown into the role a bit better. Does that make any sense? I don't know. <laughs> Just uh, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> talking about nonsense, uh, what is your position about uh, or opinion about, uh, say, religious topics or? 
otherwise which are so common in the nowadays uh, extreme metal now people are some are more like satanists some are more satan worshippers some are just you know plain old you know christians and all that stuff but people so many people have these kind of uh, non-secular views nowadays and they kind of show true lyrics. Uh, what do you think? Is it nonsense or is this spirituality or whatever you call it, is it important? Uh, <clears throat> well, I've come to a curious crossroads and that is that I realize now, having spent my most of my life being opposed to religion, organized religion, Christianity, whatever you want to call it. <clears throat> What I've come to realize in my middle age is that there's an like there's like a, mor a, a an ethic, ethical or moral glue, which holds society together, whether we believe in its figureheads or not, and that if the alternative to a moral society is one that just is entirely embraces decadence, immorality. What about reason? <clears throat> reason, oh, well, okay, I'll come to that. So, um, if, if the alternative to that is a European society that has, f for example, um, abs embraced absolute destructive hypersexuality, um, has embraced absolute decadence and immorality over some form of faith, then I've oddly enough come round to the belief that or the idea that this somehow is is an element of social glue that holds some form of the fabric society together and without it we're complete we're almost unmoored because we haven't replaced it with anything else you know we've only replaced it with with the vacuous empty nature of celebrity and instant gratification yeah instant gratification dead you know culture i mean you you mentioned r rationality i mean this is also what's missing from modern society is that the foundations and cornerstones of european civilization are built upon empiricism rationality reasoned debate uh, and the scientific mathematical measurement of um, how can we say the b belief in structure of modern society the the ability to reach consensus which is almost entirely missing from a modern society that's uh, that's it's so odd we seem to have embraced a like a gender driven or identity driven theocratic ideal but yet it's completely empty of the body of traditional spiritual belief you know this is getting so deep that we now, we now have to go to the question sorry sorry yeah, it's, no it's don't be sorry I'm, what i'm trying to say here is like uh, does it even matter that we live and exist are we just empty shells in a cosmic, I don't know, vast space, or is there something uh, that, you know, something hidden that we need to find in order to, you know, uh, figure out and unlock the secrets of life? Well, <clears throat> wow, there's a question. Uh, well, let me put it to you like this. Um, I, I don't believe that there is a destination, but I believe in the importance of the journey. I've come to believe in the importance of the journey. I mean, I don't believe in the spiritual kingdoms that either side claim to hold the key to, but the journey to understanding our place in this universe is, is important and, if we, it, and it gives us meaning. And if we take it as a metaphor, i.e. that we don't take heaven as a reality, we take it as a sense of I don't know, bliss or overcoming or something like this, okay, or whatever name you want to put on it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get tons of shit for saying heaven. <laughs> But you know what I mean? Um, it's, it's the journey. Like, uh, you know... Not the band. <laughs> yeah, well, I, you know, journey's all right. I have, because I have some good journey stories. Um, 
we played with them at Bang Your Head before. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, it's very funny stories like that. Will you do a Streetlight People cover at someday? I can tell you some funny stories. Yeah, no, it's um, the, I think that the, the, I would say the process of Gnosis, the process of the journey through um, all of this to understanding our place is, is, gives, defines human life. And without it, it seems far more empty. But yet, having said that at the same time, I do believe we are on a rock by chance hurtling through space into infinite darkness. And doesn't it sound like a <laughs> bit odd? It, it is odd, yeah. This is, we're, I mean, think of all the millions of spermata that came to make you <laughs> out of pure chance. And here you are sitting on it. Like, to, I'm very interested, I'm totally fascinated with, sorry to hijack a thing again. I'm totally fascinated with the concept that um, there's the black and white answer doesn't interest me generally. I'm interested in the gray reasons in between that make. So when somebody says to me, let's say from the right or the left, oh, that's the reason why that happened. That instantly makes me want to think of 50 reasons why it happened and grind their argument into tiresome dust and just go, well, there's also geography. There's also, you know, there's the weather. There's all this, like, because if anything that chaos theory teaches us, mathematical chaos theory, it teaches us that there are a multitude of agents, active and passive agents at play in any one um, circumstance, such as us sitting on this couch. Think of all the things that went before this to make this moment. So when I hear like, oh, the Syrian refugee crisis is this, it really, is it that? Well, how about it's also about the weather? It's about a drought. It's about people from the land moving to the city who are a different religion to the Pete, to the Alawites in this in, in in the city, who then wanted bread, who then wanted work, which led to protests, which led to the uprising against the government. So there's, I just mentioned like what eight exactly. cir circumstances that led mm -hmm. to that first rock being thrown in anger, whatever you want. So I tend to think of or try to think of most things on those terms it can, in that when I hear somebody from either side go, oh, that's the reason that happened. Is, is that really the, that's the only reason? Because if we submit to, like I said to my, you know, say to people like, <clears throat> why did the First World War start? There's, what, 10, 5,000 books on why the First World War started. We don't really know. But it was a multitude of reasons that led up to that Gabriella Princip firing the you know, killing uh, the Ferdinand or whatever, you know, in Sarajevo. But there were so many coefficients that led to that moment. So I'm sort of mathematically obsessed with the... <laughs> I totally get it because Sorry, I... Sorry, that's like... <laughs> no, no, that's a really good answer because I think that's exactly what people, people really should learn that, you know, like you said, chaos theory, it's all about this multitude of different... Uh, Agents, like you said, and some random factors which we don't know. Some might have a bad day, and that ends up in you know killing somebody. Then again, if he or she had like good sex prior to that shooting, maybe it didn't happen. Maybe if he had a hangover, he would be like, "Oh fuck, I have this headache. I cannot you're go killing people." You're totally right. I mean, like, okay, so I I had a conversation with um with this kid in California. He said to me, we need a, a Marxist revolution in the, in the United States. And I said, a Marxist revolution in the United States? Okay. So, how many people live in the United States? What is it, 328 million? Something like that. Okay. How many guns do you reckon? I said to him, are in the United States. 500 million? Okay. How many vets are there? I, it, is this really what you want? This incredible conflagration of blood on the streets. Now, as it turned out, we kept on talking and I said, look, I've just been in Cambodia. Um, I've been to the killing fields to year zero. And we talked about Pol Pot, you know. But, you know, he was educated in the Sorbonne in Paris. He's, he's not this working class socialist revolutionary. He's a middle class intellectual who was, when I went digging for the history, who was um, shunned by a woman of high society in Cambodia who he was dating and then went and exacted his revenge on the society she came from. And I, I, we were talking about this, you know, and eventually the guy, he climbed down from his high horse and we discussed the nature of these things. You know, as it turned out, he'd never left the state of California, uh, you know. How convenient. Yeah, well, oh, convenient for me to, 
educate the young man. Well, now we're getting, you know, like uh, so far away. I mean, yeah, we could yeah, basically but, continue this for hours. Okay, but, 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 the, but the, drum, the drum sound on the new Primordial is... You know, yeah, check it out. Uh, I think we need to, you know, start, you know, putting the uh, start of an end. Uh, but now this is a proper uh, moment to remind you people that metal can be educating. It can be more than just you wanking off to your favorite Bathory album and all that stuff. But you can do that too. Yeah, you can do That's that too. You can, you can do both. So before, before we stop and, and let, let our finish our beers, what lies ahead in... Uh, near a distant future for Primordial. What is there to happen that people should be aware? Um, I'm going to start a Marxist socialist revolution uh, in, in California, in Finland, actually. Now, <laughs> well, put it to you, but just to bookend that last statement, I, I think the glory and beauty of heavy metal, in a sense, is its ability to embrace the absolute visceral uh, nature an absolutely visceral nature and the, and to be absolutely reactionary and violent and aggressive so i like kind of like it's it's really strange i like i like to see myself inside and outside the bubble at the same time in that you can be a uh you can apply the things we just talked about to whatever you're singing about but at the same time i want to be somebody you know what i mean it's like the beauty of that absolute statement of absolutism is something that I find is the, how we say, revealed glory of heavy metal. And so, yes, wanking over your Bathory albums is perfectly fine. So now you, what you need to do is Google Schrodinger's cat. If you don't know what we are talking about, Google it and you will figure out a little bit more yeah. about this interview than without it. Oh, also, the Dunning-Kruger effect may be applicable as well. And also Google up those battery albums, so you know where do you know Wang to. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Uh, we're looking for your show, but where will you tour next? Uh, I don't know. Uh, because we're all you know working class gentlemen, we have lots of other things to do rather than be on tour all the time. Uh, no, I don't know. I have no idea. Um, when we, from what you just rolls on, it's like an institution, like a creaky old institution in all our lives that you can neglect for a couple of months but eventually you've got to go back and paint the walls or fix some decaying you know sideboard or something and we we all have a part to play in the upkeep of this institution but yet at the same time we're not a professional band we're not you know you're not, we're not metallica yet <laughs> just not yet metallica no no uh, we're just no it's um it just rolls on i don't know uh, and while it's still is a thing of um, beauty and amusement and passion and whatever. We'll, we'll keep fucking having a go. So wh where will people most easily find, because they now didn't get any answer for touring or gigs, where they will find the information when you will be around? Uh, good point. Um, follow me on Instagram so I can become an influencer and get paid for that. No, um, I, I don't know. Um, Promotional Facebook page is the easiest place. Um, I don't know. We're not very good at uh, we're like, we're not very good at playing the game. Um, I'm sure um, my 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 good friend Adam from Behemoth would have a, a perfectly prepared. You know, he would have an amazing answer for this. But I don't know. I mean, there's metalblade.de for the stuff, and there's Primordial on Facebook, and I'm on Instagram, and blah blah blah. But you know, we're not going to be we're not going to be touring every small parish. <laughs> Um, in the year 2019, you're going to have to make the effort to come and see us. But if you do, we will try and do two, three hours of a set and play some strange songs and, you know, give it old style heavy metal. One last question. Truly, one last question. Why comrade? Why comrade? Yeah. Why do I use that word? Yes, or? <laughs> that's what my friend actually asked me to, you know, ask you. Why? Um, well, it's part of my, um, uh, you know, revisionary Marxist view of modern Europe in that, and the revolutionary seeds I'm seeking to sow. No, that's not true. I, I don't know. It's, um, I always call people chief and boss, comrade. I always call people, it's like, um, how we say, it's like a, the first contact with a person you don't know. I always, you try and throw in a little social curveball to see how they react and I, I always say thanking you sir comrade good evening 
Well, thank you, comrade. Uh, nice for you to, you know, show up and drink beer and talk, talk stuff. Uh, and then people go, oh, huh? huh? Okay. And then they don't realize what a dickhead you are because you've, you know, you've smoke and mirrors, hoodwink them. Comrade. <laughs> so, take that, Chief, and uh, be sure to like them on Facebook so you know what's going on. And if you don't, well, screw you. Bye-bye. It's okay. Take it easy. Keep peace. <laughs> Keep peace. <laughs> God, I'm awesome. That was a bit lengthy. Yeah. I always try to go for like 10. That's why oh, she really? waved. Okay. And so I have to, and then like, maybe, maybe now we're like 15 and like, okay, this is...